Zuko and I met his children in a church-run orphanage. What? When was that? How long ago? What year? Oh, was that it? Vor 20 Jahren? 20 years ago in German? Was the primary demographic for this series supposed to be German immigrants? Well, no, of course not. It must be for blind people because clearly having eyes doesn't help. Oh, great, this again. Making a show for the blind. Why am I not surprised? So Himura, Yuko, and a whole bunch of other sad kids were at this orphanage 20 years ago. Got it. But right away, you have to take a split second because that opening frame is so nonspecific. This show already has two timelines, so when you see 20 years later on a black screen, there's a moment where you stop and you have to ask yourself if it's 20 years ago from the present or 20 years ago from when Himura and Yuko were in high school. But why should we have to ask that? It's like they knew it was confusing, but rather than actually prevent audiences from having to ask themselves that incredibly stupid question, they decided to write it in German so that people would be too confused to get confused. Anyway, Yuko, Himura, and the rest were at this orphanage because of vague tragedy involving girl and fire. Got it? Why did I have to remember? I know the feel, bro. I wish I could forget this show too. Anyway, Himura looks at a broken watch and then it's back to school for Kuze's flea market. Uh, what? I'm not interested in your hand-me-downs, Kuze. What's going on? I thought they said you didn't have to come to school anymore. Huh? Is that like the polite Japanese way of expelling a student? Yeah, you don't have to come to class anymore. We're not going to grade you if you do, because you're not part of the class. Uh, we decided to relocate you to somewhere you might feel more comfortable. Your house. Also, what is the point of this? Oh, hey, Yuko. Present for your boyfriend? I'd like to hope so. Right, Himura Senpai? I hate you, even now. So put me out of your mind forever. No. You gotta love Himura's response, though. He just stares her down like he wants her dead. Well, give it a few episodes, man. I'll be right there with you. Yuko, didn't you say the astrology club was disbanded? Yeah. So why do you still have the key to the roof? I guess that it was probably an upperclassman. They made a spare key without permission? You, Himura! Rules Lord! School life is always much more interesting, with a little intrigue thrown in, don't you think? Not for me. I can't afford to cause any problems. Hmm. Why would that be? They waived my entrance fee and tuition. I can't afford to jeopardize it. Well, what does that mean? What, does the school have a double standard zero tolerance policy for just you? And why did they let you come there for free? I'm a special case. Why? I'm a special case. Did they let a bunch of orphans in to generate some good PR? I'm a special case. Do you mean like, special needs? I'm a special case. What made you special? Were you smarter, stronger, really good at karate? What was it? I'm a special case. Okay, enough. I'm kind of being a dick for pretending that there's no answer. But not really, because the actual answer that does exist got cut for no reason! See, in the visual novel, it's very clear. Himura got nearly perfect scores on his entrance exams. Because of this, the school gave him a full scholarship.
However, the money will only keep flowing as long as he maintains a top tier grade point average. That is what he doesn't want to jeopardize. In both versions, he works nights to pay for an apartment, but that's not particularly relevant. The point is that he has no time for intrigue or adventures or fun of any kind because every minute he has is devoted to real life responsibilities. The fun is done. But here, he just sounds like a dick. I don't want to enjoy life because school. He doesn't say that he has to maintain good grades or perfect attendance or live up to some double standard for student behavior. He just doesn't want to have fun. Because yeah, that's a relatable protagonist, right? I mean, what a great story. The kid who always does his homework, never gets into trouble, and never does anything intriguing. The fun is done. You're damn right it is. I mean, not that this was ever fun to begin with, but geez, next you're gonna have him tell Yuko to fuck off so that he can jerk off at home for the rest of the run time. Don't come near me again. Son of a bitch! I hate you, even now, so put me out of your mind forever. I'll say this one more time. Don't come near me again. Why do these two end up getting together? Could you make it any more contrived? Why don't you just put him in a wheelchair and have Yuko's true love kiss magically cure his paraplegia or some shit? Monsieur has been locked! Anyway, where the hell were we? You should just forget everything. And you should completely forget about that old red watch. <clears throat> you still dream about those things every night, don't you? Okay, you win. I'm out. Again, why would Himura want to be with this crazy sack of crazy? Don't come near me again. Shut up, you. We already know how this ends, but why? She's obviously been stalking you and watching you sleep. What does it take to scare you away? Ha! Ah, not Beethoven! Of course not. It's a dream. Man, can't you just taste the relevance? You sure you don't have anywhere you want to go? Oh, Christ. Yay, more of this. And Kuza even tries to ask Mizuki out on a date. I mean, you came all the way to Australia. It would be a shame if you didn't do anything special while you're here. But of course not. Instead, Mizuki takes Kuze to... Renji's house. To do laundry. Kuze-san and I are doing laundry, so I need you to give me your dirty clothes right now. Huh? Hey, why don't you wash all the sex uniforms while you're at it? Before you get an STD! <laughs> this is completely ridiculous! What? What is the joke here? Why is this a scene? I'm just sorting colors from whites. Then what on earth am I doing here in the first place? Exactly! But that still doesn't stop every second of this from being a total waste of time! She is actually my greatest music teacher. I believe you might have heard of her. Her name is Metronome. <laughs> the fuck is that supposed to mean? Oh, well, thank God the laundry's done. Mizuki gets no dial tone while trying to dial 119, so she does the next best thing and slams Kuze's head into every solid object in the room. But when that doesn't work, she just puts him on the couch. If an angel smiles down on me... I guess that means you're fine. Is this a dream? I wonder sometimes. Remember scenes like this for later, because, I mean, it's, it's just weird now, but... Later on, it's really gonna piss you the fuck off. Oh, and I guess Zoom is 002. What? That's German for to the. That doesn't even mean anything. Anyway, Kuze eventually wakes up and Mizuki leaves before noticing Kuze's mail piling up. Hmm, that'll be a plot point. Or not! He burns all his letters and whines about the past, blah, blah, blah. 
I'm just guarding everything, that's all. Okay, well, if there's nothing left of your character, then could you maybe go be pathetic somewhere else? We return to the Chronicle of the Burned Watch already in progress and find out that the gray-haired girl in the fire is Himura's dead sister. She died during the Great Earthquake that destroyed his hometown in Japan. But even though we saw Miyako looking out over the wreckage in the first series, the earthquake is never specifically discussed here. Well, at least we had time for fucking laundry. Oh, hey, Yuko. Brother! Brother! You're drawing the great brother, you? I said stop calling me brother. <laughs> a younger kid or maybe have a woman do it you know like bart simpson david matranga uncomfortably finding the limits of his vocal range could not have been the best option you're drawing the great brother you i said stop calling me brother also yeah stop calling him brother you weirdo it's even less acceptable than when k called hero brother because these two don't even know each other yeah, we find out later that Yuko lost her parents in the disaster, but that doesn't give her the right to declare someone her replacement family. And Tamura's objection is not unreasonable. Back off already before you give him the cooties. Do you really like drawing, Yukun? Kind of. <laughs> You're really good at it, Yukun. Yeah, I know, this is actually cute, and you probably think I'm nitpicking something that's not really relevant. Trust me, as you'll eventually see, this is a really big deal. Yuko settles on calling Himura Yukun since, you know, Yu is his first name. And then it's time for some art. Will you please draw me next, Yukun? Pretty please? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> And that is why Himura doesn't want Yuko to call him brother. He's still getting over the tragic death of his sister, who was really his only friend. And so that's why when he looks at Yuko, he still sees his sister in her. Yeah, I know, I know. It feels like I'm probably just pointing out the glaringly obvious. But give me some rope here, guys. I'm laying the groundwork for the most difficult argument I will ever have to make. Anyway, the two bond over him or his drawings until one day he finally runs out of paper. He decides to draw Yuko on the last page, but then... Yukun, do you want a little sister? Don't you want a sister? Brother, you! Don't call me brother! <gasps> My sister died. She's dead. And my voice actor died with her. You see how my new one sounds? Why would I want a new sister? And now Yuko knows that Himura can't bring himself to call her sister because his actual sister just died in the very same earthquake that claimed her parents' lives. You know, I wouldn't have to point all this out if future events and the entire story of their relationship didn't hinge so critically on these three entire interactions. Yeah, because that makes all of the sense, doesn't it? Anyway, we cut from 20 years ago back to Himura and Yuko in high school. Why even bother? Senpai, I'm so glad I finally get to see you again. I hate you, even now. And do you know why that is? No idea. You're so dense sometimes. I can see that you haven't changed at all. Are you trying to pick a fight? You Himura, tit puncher! You should know that you were my first love. And you know something else? My first love hasn't ended yet. Yukun? I'll make you forget. I will. I'll erase all of the painful memories that you have. Yeah, play the thing. I hate you. Even you know what? Forget it. Does it even need to be said anymore at this point? 
Does Yuko have bipolar? Yes? No? Then start running! Meanwhile, because we haven't been full frontal assaulted by art recently, it's time for Kuze's story to kick into high gear. Metronome marking. Normal syncopation. Normal. Kuzekun, you're a little bit slow today. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. -tuck -tuck. The rhythm measures the time remaining. I don't even know where to start, guys. I mean. Never has more time and energy been spent saying less. The idea they're going for here is insanely simple. Kuze loves music, but it reminds him of how little time he has left before his apparently terminal heart condition kills him. Ironically, this makes him miserable, and the enjoyment of the music has become an act, hence the masks. However, the imagery is so in your face that it screams of desperation, and the idea it represents is laughably ridiculous. Apparently, the gears must mean that they're comparing the ticking of a clock to the ticking of a metronome. So they're comparing time itself to time signature. Wow. You'd really have to go looking to find that analogy. I mean, who's just gonna think of that? I mean, actively, much less passively as you're watching this show. It's so overwritten and overdone. I mean, why should I really be surprised? Here's an analogy that would make sense for a character we were supposed to like. You show him playing his violin on the stage and he plays a beautiful full length piece. Of Vivaldi, Beethoven, Pachelbel, whatever. Pick one, preferably something public domain. Then he finishes the piece and bows, but he looks up to see there's no audience. Then he awakens in a cold sweat to realize he wasn't really playing. The horror he would experience would come from the fact that once he's dead, he won't be able to play for anyone or make an audience happy ever again. You could elaborate on that later to clarify the point, but that in and of itself would still be a motivation that would give the character some humility and a reasonable, relatable fear. That of being alone when you die. Instead, we have a selfish prick excommunicating everyone from his life because he apparently wants to die alone, all while leading on a teenage girl, thereby completely contradicting his goals and inevitably hurting her. WHY SHOULD I CARE ABOUT THIS ASSHOLE?! Speaking of hurt and desperation... I just couldn't get to sleep. I came out to cool off. I see. Have you gotten it fixed already? Fixed it? Uh, oh yeah. No, it's still broken. Oh. Also, I'd like to point out that in between comments, Mizuki teleported from behind her own fence to Kuze's porch. Uh Mizuki strokes Kuze's huge throbbing ego by talking about how his music is the second coming of Jesus for way too many minutes. But just when I think I'm going to fall asleep... I think that I've already started to fall in love with you. <laughs> oh god. That's the end of the episode, isn't it? I can't believe this. I don't know. Maybe you guys are into this shit. Maybe you have a fantasy of banging somebody that's old enough to be your dad. Maybe you want to actually bang your dad. I don't know. This is just so bizarre to me. Again, if Mizuki was just having this crush on her own, if it came from within herself but was never really encouraged, I wouldn't care. But Kuze is actively flirting with her, hitting on her, and leading her on like crazy! It's not right! It's just not right! It's not right! I...
It's not right. Let it all out.